Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, and welcome to this session where we will have a presentation and discussion of U equals to U and its relevance to breastfeeding and by extension, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV. Uh, my name is Nadia Samagudu. I'm a, an HIV uh, pediatrician and I'm a technical advisor for pediatric HIV, pediatric and adolescent HIV at the Institute of Human Virology in Maryland and in Nigeria. And so this session has a pre-recorded um, presentation uh, by uh, Lynn Moffison. And this topic is undetectable is equal to untransmittable. How do we think about it in the context of breastfeeding and PMTCT? And you may have heard about this international campaign that is looking at how it is important to spread the word that once someone has been on treatment for six months or more, and is virally suppressed, they are protected uh, and their sexual partners are protected from trans, uh, transmission of HIV. However, we need to think about that in the context of a different kind of transmission of HIV, which is mother to child transmission. And so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker uh, who is Lynn Moffinson and who really does not need much introduction, but I'll introduce her anyway. She's a pediatric infectious disease specialist who has spent her career doing research on prevention and treatment of pediatric and maternal HIV infection. In 2014, she reti retired from the US NIH after 26 years of service where she led many of their key clinical trials on PMTCT and pediatric and maternal treatment. She currently serves as a senior HIV technical advisor to the research program at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, where she is assisting in evaluating implementation of many of the interventions on treatment and prevention that she helped to design while at the NIH. So we'll go ahead and listen to her um, presentation. And then after that, we'll discuss uh, the topic with our panelists who I will introduce after this presentation. Thank you. My talk today is going to focus on implications of U equals U for breastfeeding. Undetectable equals untransmissible signifies that a person with HIV who receives treatment and achieves and maintains an undetectable viral load cannot transmit HIV to their partner. In the JAMA paper by Fauci and colleagues, a number of important principles of U equals U are outlined in order for art to provide benefit, consistent adherence is required. Achieving undetectable viral load takes time, so U does not equal U immediately after starting treatment. Monitoring to ensure viral load remains undetectable is critical, but the definition of undetectable varies, and in the US guidelines, it's defined as RNA under 200. Finally, stopping therapy negates the validity of assuming U equals U. The evidence supporting U equals U comes from studies of sexual transmission that followed thousands of MSM and heterosexual HIV discordant couples. The figure is a meta-analysis of six studies, including over 2,800 heterosexual discordant couples showing no risk of HIV transmission in those with confirmed suppressed viral load. However, note there's variability in defining the threshold of undetectable from 50 to 400. The table shows you similar findings from three studies, including over 1,000 MSM, using a threshold of less than 200 and undetectable. No genetically linked HIV transmission occurred when the partner with HIV was taking treatment and stably suppressed as defined by the study providing us with robust evidence that individuals do not sexually transmit HIV if they are consistently virally suppressed. Both the CDC and WHO recommendations on U equals U note that the evidence for U equals U applies to sexual transmission only. And the question I'll try to address in the next few minutes is does U equals U apply to postnatal transmission through breastfeeding? So first, let's examine the evidence related to U equals U and peripartum, that is in utero and intrapartum transmission in a non-breastfeeding population. This slide shows data from the two largest studies, including data on timing of treatment initiation, 
viral load at delivery, and then transmission risk stratified by delivery viral load. And first, we're going to focus on women who initiate treatment during pregnancy. The first study is the French perinatal cohort, an observational study of HIV positive women delivering in 90 centers across France. Transmission with delivery viral load, less than 50 in the red box, was 0.5%. Viral load between 50 and 400, 2%. Viral load greater than 400, 3.1%. The second study is the National Study of HIV in Pregnancy and Childhood, population-based surveillance in Ireland and the UK. Transmission with delivery viral load, again, the red box was less, uh, was 0.1%, while transmission with delivery viral load over 50 was 1.1%. And in both studies, transmission risk was associated with the duration of treatment prior to delivery. While the risk of transmission was low in women with delivery viral load under 50, it was not zero in these women who first started treatment during pregnancy and was even higher when using higher thresholds to define undetectable. This slide shows data from the same two studies, but now focused on women who were on ART preconception and throughout pregnancy. And in the red box, you can see there were no transmissions in over 4,500 women with delivery RNA let under 50 in these studies. In the French cohort, not included in this table, are 312 women on preconception treatment who interrupted their treatment in the first trimester. And here, four of 312 transmitted to their infant, despite two of the four who transmitted having delivery viral load less than 50. There are significant limitations of evidence when considering U equals U for postnatal transmission. Evidence for U equals U for MTCT comes from the developed world in formula fed populations, and there are very limited breastfeeding data. Most studies exclude the full breastfeeding period and only look at early transmission, and they're limited to studies of women starting treatment during pregnancy as opposed to those on lifelong treatment. So what do we know about breastfeeding HIV transmission? First, there's a difference in postnatal transmission risk between early versus later breastfeeding. In the absence of treatment, several studies suggest a substantial proportion of breast milk transmission occurs early before age one to two months. And this may be due to the high T cell content of colostrum in early breast milk, including activated CD4 cells, which could theoretically increase transmission risk. However, there's also a continuous, albeit lower risk throughout lactation, averaging 0.6 to 0.9% per month. Thus, for women who are not on treatment and who breastfeed for 18 to 24 months, the overall postnatal transmission can be as high as 21 to 27%. This slide looks at early breast milk transmission from two pre-art studies the Nairobi randomized trial of formula versus breastfeeding before treatment was available, and the SAINT trial where they compared formula versus breastfed infants receiving one of two short course preventive regimens. The graph looks at the risk of early postnatal infection, excluding in utero infection, through six to eight weeks postpartum, with formula fed infants shown in purple and breastfed infants in blue. And you can see comparing transmission in formula fed to breastfed infants over the same time period, there is a 6% higher rate of infections attributable to breastfeeding during this early time period in both studies. As I noted earlier, this period coincides with the time breast milk is highly cellular in nature. And this figure shows you the number of cells per ml in breast milk over time, green showing macrophages, white showing lymphocytes, most of which are T cells, including activated T cells. And you can clearly see the cellular composition of milk is highest in the first four to six weeks of life. So is the high rate of infection in early weeks due to the high cellular content of milk increasing infectivity? This South African study looked at the association of cell-associated DNA and cell-free RNA with postnatal infection in infants at six weeks and at six months. Controlling for CD4 and plasma viral load, 
cell-associated virus was significantly associated with early but not late transmission. While cell-free RNA was associated with risk at both time periods, you can see cell-associated RNA had the greatest association in the early period. So why is the association of early postnatal transmission with cell-associated virus important? And this is because treatment appears to reduce breast milk cell-free viral RNA, but not necessarily cell-associated viral RNA. And these uh, are data from Botswana, looking at the percent of women with detectable RNA, shown in blue, and DNA in orange, and women receiving treatment versus no treatment. And you can see there is a significant decrease in breast milk RNA in women on treatment, but no significant difference in breast milk DNA between those on or not on treatment. The risk of late postnatal infection persists at a low level for the duration of breastfeeding. And these are data from the breastfeeding and HIV transmission study. It evaluated infection rates in over 4,000 breastfed infants who were uninfected at age one month from nine clinical trials. And you can see there's a steady accumulation of infection over time, basically a straight line, amounting to an infection rate of 0.74% per month of breastfeeding. And that's in addition to the risk of transmission prior to age one month. What do we know about breast milk viral load versus plasma viral load in transmission? Breast milk cell-free RNA is quantitatively associated with the risk of transmission. And this graph shows you HIV incidence by breast milk viral load in 275 HIV positive women in Kenya. And you can easily see transmission increases with increasing breast milk viral load. Women with consistently detectable breast milk virus were more likely to transmit than those with intermittent or no virus. So is there an association of plasma viral load, what we actually measure to determine U equals U, and breast milk viral load? And this graph compa uh, compares viral load in plasma on the x-axis to that in breast milk on the y-axis. And while breast milk viral load was lower than plasma, they were correlated. And for every one log increase in plasma viral load, there was a 0.58 log increase in breast milk viral load. So does undetectable plasma viral load always mean undetectable breast milk viral load? And these are data from the BAN study, which compared prevention of postnatal transmission through six months with maternal treatment versus daily infant nevirapine, both being equally effective. 221 mothers had paired plasma and breast milk specimens, and mothers with detectable plasma viral load had a significantly increased risk of having detectable breast milk viral load as well. In most cases, undetectable plasma viral load was associated with undetectable breast milk viral load, but two women had detect undetectable plasma viral load, but low level detectable breast milk viral load at six weeks postpartum. So in breastfeeding populations, it's more difficult to assess the address, uh, the issue of U equals U. Interpartum transmission cannot be easily distinguished from early breast milk transmission. So we need to assess these together. And a number of studies have reported on combined in utero interpartum and early postpartum transmission in the first one to two months of life. And this table shows you data on early transmission from four studies in the breastfeeding population. The first looking solely at women starting treatment during pregnancy in South Africa. The second, a mixed population where 50% of women started before and 50% started during pregnancy in Malawi. The third in women mostly starting before pregnancy in South Africa. And the final in Kenya, the BAN study where maternal treatment was started postpartum. If we just focus on transmission from women with undetectable viral load, less than 50 in red, in contrast to the data from Europe that we saw in formula feeding populations, you see transmission does occur in women with undetectable viral load, albeit it is a low rate of 0.3 to 0.9%. The Moyo study noted that while delivery viral load was undetectable in three mothers who transmitted, 
two women did not have prior measurements and one had viral load over a thousand three months before delivery. The ability to look at sustained undetectable viral load was only available from the band trial. And here they noted there was no transmission in five women who were undetectable in both plasma and breast milk at all time points postpartum. However, to really assess if U equals U for breastfeeding, follow-up through breastfeeding cessation is needed, and very few studies have provided us with data on final infant infection status at the end of breastfeeding stratified by maternal postpartum viral load in women receiving treatment. And three studies have some data, the PROMISE trial and two observational cohorts, one in Malawi, one in Tanzania, and I'll provide more detail on the next slides. Now, the PROMISE trial randomized HIV-positive women with a high CD4 count and their uninfected breastfeeding infants to either maternal ART or infant nevirapine at 6 to 14 days postpartum. Viral load was measured at baseline and 6, 14, and 50 weeks postpartum in the women. Postnatal infection rates, as you can see, were very low, only 0.6% at 12 months of age, with no significant difference by study arm. Baseline delivery maternal viral load was not associated with postnatal transmission, but time varying maternal viral load during breastfeeding was significantly associated with infant infection in the maternal art arm, but not the infant nevirapine arm. And of the seven postnatal infections in the maternal art arm, two had plasma viral load less than 40 in the visit prior to the infection diagnosis. In one case, the infant was infected at week 36, and all maternal prior viral loads were less than 40. And in the other, the infant was infected at week 14, when the mother's viral load was less than 40, but at week six, her viral load was between 50 and 1,000. The Malawi DREAM project enrolled 311 HIV-positive pregnant women starting treatment during pregnancy who breastfed for a median of 6.5 months. And in this study, women with high CD4 stopped at ART at six months. 12 months HIV status was available for 278 infants. At one month, there were two infections, both in mothers with short antenatal and ART duration. Looking at postnatal infection between one and six months, when all women were on treatment, there were two infections, one in a woman with undetectable plasma RNA, although breast milk RNA was detectable, suggesting that plasma viral load alone may not be sufficient to assess the risk of transmission during the breastfeeding period, complicating U equals U for NTCT. And the other was in a woman with low level plasma viremia but undetectable breast milk viral load. The final study is a prospective cohort of HIV positive individuals in Tanzania, 228 infants uninfected at age four <clears throat> to 12 weeks were born to mothers on treatment for a median of 23 months. <clears throat> so most of these women were on treatment preconception. Infants were breastfed for a median of one year Final infant infection status was available on 186 infants at a median age of 14 months, and postnatal maternal viral load was assessed at least once within 11 months postpartum. Maternal viral load was at 6 to 12 months was below 100, which was the lower limit of detection in 80 to 83 percent, the red box, and less than 1,000 in 92 to 94 percent in the blue box. And there were two infant postnatal infections at 18 months, first in a mother who had a high viral load at five weeks postpartum, and the second in a mother with undetectable viral load at six weeks postpartum, but who then stopped treatment with no repeat test. Thus, there were no infections if undetectable viral load and the mother consistently took treatment. So where are we with U equals U for postnatal breast milk transmission? Well, U equals U is based on data showing persons on ART consistently achieving undetectable viral load, defined as less than 200, have essentially no sexual transmission to HIV negative partners. And I think you can see from the data we have discussed, we can clearly state a threshold of 200 cannot be used when referring to peripartum or postnatal NTCT 
the threshold must be under 50. In formula feeding populations, data indicate there is likely a zero risk of transmission if a mother's on treatment and achieved viral suppression to less than 50 prior to pregnancy and maintains art and suppression through delivery. So U equals U may apply here. Data on breast milk transmission and viral load are more limited and complex, especially given we are measuring plasma rather than milk viral load. While generally plasma viral load correlates with breast milk viral load, rarely virus may be undetectable in plasma, but present in low levels in milk or vice versa. Breast milk cell associated virus is important in early transmission and less affected by treatment. And the limited available data suggests the risk of early breast milk transmission is not zero in women who first initiate treatment during pregnancy, even if delivery viral load is less than 50. Late breast milk transmission will require both plasma and breast milk virus to be undetectable for the entire breastfeeding period. But data on women who are on art preconception and consistently suppressed throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding are really not yet available. However, we can state, even if there is residual risk, it does appear to be extremely low. So in summary, if we define undetectable viral load as less than 50, we can say U equals U in non-breastfeeding populations when women start art and retrieve suppression prior to and maintain it during pregnancy. U may equal U in the breastfeeding population or at least be associated with a very low risk of postnatal infection if women start treatment and achieve suppression prior to pregnancy and maintain it throughout pregnancy. And in the end, decisions related to breastfeeding are really a risk-benefit balance. And in low and middle-income countries, the benefits of breastfeeding clearly outweigh the small potential risk. And in high-income countries, individualized decision-making can be done with informed choice by the woman. Thank you very much for your attention. driven presentation and I really appreciate uh, your taking the time to prepare this. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is to introduce our panelists who are going to discuss this uh, a little bit before we, we open up Q&A to our audience. So first I will introduce uh, Brittany Cameron who is a 35 year old woman from Canada who was diagnosed with HIV when she was 36 weeks pregnant with her first child in March 2006. At that time, she was told she could not breastfeed and that she has a lived experience quite relevant to our topic today. Brittany wears many hats in the HIV sector um, and she's the current co-chair of the Canad Canadian Positive People Network and part of the Canadian U equals U steering committee and also the peer engagement coordinator. She also happens to be a social service, a social worker, which is really important for this field. Um, the next person, we have some background noise. Okay. So the next person is uh, Lucy Wanjiku Njenga, who is the founding coordinator of Salty Skika, the first network of adolescents living with HIV in Kenya, and the founder and team leader of Positive Young Women Voices, which is a grassroots community-based organization that seeks to empower adolescent girls and young women living with or affected by HIV. She has served as a delegate, board member, and advisory group member representing people living with HIV in several organizations, including UNAIDS. Uh, I, I think someone will have to turn off your mic for now. Okay, I'll continue. So our last speaker, our last panelist will be Fungai Morau, who is a passionate researcher in the HIV field with special interest in mental health, especially quality of life for people living with HIV, migration and education, and educating adolescent girls in making informed choices about their sexuality and well-being. Fungai studied at the Institute of Development Studies and has an MA 
uh, where she in poverty and development, where her dissertation focused on mental health of undocumented women living with HIV in the UK. She currently works as an independent consultant uh, and is affiliated with several health and community related advisory boards and committees. So I will welcome everybody to our talk. Uh, and I also welcome Arlene to join us in this uh, uh, panel. Um, I think you have all heard uh, Lynn's presentation and the information she's given, but especially when you look at the last slide where she summarizes what she talks about. What I want to ask you all as people with different lived experiences that are all relevant to this topic, what does you equals you mean for you as a woman who has either already had children and has breastfed children or planning to? And I'll start with Brittany. What does it mean for you, especially given the presentation that Lynn made today? Thanks, Nadia. Um, I think for me, you equals you is about choice. It's about um, choice in, in your health and decision-making power. And for me, one can't make uh, informed choices without accurate uh, information to uh, their bodies and, and potential risks. And so for me, when I think about you equals you in the context of, of breastfeeding or just in general, I always go back to the, the center of the you equals you um, campaign and movement really is about people living with HIV having accurate access, uh, science-based, evidence-informed access to information about our bodies um, so that we can make informed choices around um, what's best for ourselves and our families. Okay. Thank you, Brittany. Lucy, what, how, what would you say to that? Same question. Thank you. So um, it's more or less what Brittany has said for sure. For me, you because you means I am able to uh, live with HIV and not feel scared. I am able to uh, look forward to having children and not being so scared that I might infect them. It means that I can have, um, I can have, uh, I am able to have a, a, a fruitful relationship with my partner because I do not feel scared that I might transmit HIV to them. And I don't know if there's more powerful thing that has ever happened uh, second to uh, treatment <laughs> to people living with HIV than you, Kozio. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. How about Fungai, your thoughts on this? Oh, my thoughts, I think I think the two, two ladies have uh, pretty much covered it, but um, I think it, it is really important that when we are, as, as women with HIV, when we get all the, the data that we, we understand it, it is broken down to a language that we understand what does you cause you in breastfeeding and in, in uh, transmission HIV to sexual partners. And while breastfeeding can happen, given the woman has choice, I think we need to look beyond that, that if you're going to breastfeed your child for six months, two days, whatever it is, there are other aspects. If a woman suffers postnatal depression, we need to have all those other intersecting things that we're supporting this mom the best way we can, whether they choose to breastfeed or not to breastfeed, because it's a very, very vulnerable time for women living with HIV who may still be self-stigmatizing, but it is a Said, it's, it's it's a wonderful feeling knowing that we have now have this this message and we can um have our children and have meaningful relationships with our partners without having that 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 fear okay thank you so in in this discussion lynn had mentioned how the you equals you for uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women the thresholds have to be different Right? We're saying that for heterosexual and MSM couples, discordant, we can look at 200 or less as being able to achieve you equals you for them, meaning that they can have uh, sex without necessarily using protection if they are detected, uh, undetectable and if they are continuing to take their medication. Now, for pregnant women, the data is suggesting, as, as Lynn has presented, that we would have to use a threshold of 50 or less and the woman would have had to start ART way before pregnancy and maintain that 50 or less suppression throughout pregnancy and throughout the postpartum period, including breastfeeding. Now, we can talk about breastfeeding in terms of, you know, a woman in low and middle income countries often need to breastfeed because uh, um, formula may be expensive. But to be honest, there are women who want to breastfeed no matter whether they 
can afford formula or not. So really it has repercussions for both high income and low income countries. Now, that being said, how do you think a woman can achieve that level of, it, it's achievable, but I can see where there will be women who will say, this is very difficult for me to achieve. Start treatment before pregnancy, meaning you have to get tested before you get pregnant. A lot of women that I deal with in Nigeria found out they had HIV when they were pregnant. Okay, and some of them may have already had positive children. So how do you think this will be feasible for the average woman who has to maintain this and with the drugs that are available, how do you think that works on the patient side? So um, I'll just go with Fungai this time. <laughs> this is where I think the power of peer support comes in. It is a very difficult and can be a very lonely road when you're going into your um, HIV uh, clinician's office and they're, 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 they're telling you important numbers. And if you're not achieving those numbers and you want to, or you're already pregnant, it becomes a very lonely road. But when, when, when I, I personally think that the one thing that I've always benefit, benefited from is peer support. Mm -hmm. Speaking to my peers that have walked this path, seeing what, what it is that they did to maintain that. And it's always been quite helpful because it is, like I said, it, 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 it can be really, really daunting. But I, I will definitely say peer support, right information, correct information and again breaking down the science to a way that we understand it as community and also not shaming that if I haven't dropped down to that 50 it's it's not my fault maybe the medication maybe I'm uh, resistant maybe something's happened maybe I'm going through a traumatic time at that point in, in my life so it's about understanding what the where the individual is at and trying to meet them there with compassion care and information. Thank you. So, Brittany, you've been a peer supporter. I think you're still working as a peer supporter. How would you, now peer supporters, I also see them as liaisons between the clinical management team and, and your client or your, your, your mentee, so to speak, that you are working with. How are you going to be able to get this message to your, your, your peers versus the caregiver where, the, sorry, versus the provider where you now have to give ART of the highest suppression possible. So then that means that clinicians have to make sure that we are not giving subpar treatment to make sure that U equals U is happening for women. So how are you going to be able to do this? How do you see us being able to do this? Yeah, thank you. I actually think Fungi already answered this in the way, in, in the response to the first question. She talked about the data and language. Um, for me, it's about uh, plain language, making and ensuring that the science is is uh, you know accessible for for people across an education spectrum. Um, uh, ensuring people have access to all of their resources, especially culturally appropriate resources, um, and and you know peer support. I think it, it can it can be a benefit of two ways. So that kind of plain language piece, but also that peer advocacy piece. So um, I'll use myself as an example. If I was supporting um, a woman who was potentially wanting to breastfeed, I would, you know, help her brainstorm potential questions she wanted to ask her provider, all those kinds of things. But I think there's a really important point to highlight in this, especially with that 50 uh, viral threshold is, uh, we as as uh, child birthing humans um, literally grow a human in our in our womb for for nine months. I don't think that uh, fifty is a high threshold, uh, like respectfully. And I, I recognize that there's going to be challenges in each individual circumstance. Uh, but mm -hmm. to, to underestimate the power of 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 the birth givers um, and their ability to achieve maximum success for their families uh, is really an underestimation of how far we're willing to go. I have yet to meet a person living with HIV who's who's wanting to or willingly trying to pass on the virus. In fact, we're, we're scared to death of that. And so I think it's really important to highlight that um, that piece of information is that like we would walk across hot fire and back for our babies um, and this is no different yeah so so Lucy um, as a as a, 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 a someone who's an advocate and someone who is also um, has a provider you have a lot of background what if how 
how do you see talking to your provider if your provider is telling you you are um, suppressed and it's at less than a thousand and they think it's acceptable and now you are planning you are planning to have a child and you want to be 50 or less how are you going to relay this information to your provider to get you to that 50 so that it can be you for you I'm sorry about the background noise. I, I don't understand. I'm in the quietest of rooms in my house. <laughs> That's um, all right. I hope you get my question, though. <laughs> I, I think question? I had bits of it. You asked oh. if I if I was um if I was a uh, as an advocate, mm -hmm. and as at um at a thousand copies, and I go to my provider. How could I advocate uh, and ask to get to fifty? Right. Mm -hmm. To less than that, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, less than that, okay. Um, I think like Brittany and uh, Fungai have already mentioned, it's very important, um, regardless of where a woman is at, um, to give her the correct information. And I feel this is sometimes what is missing, uh, especially when healthcare providers might or uh, assume that uh, a woman is not um, is not knowledgeable or is not capable of getting from a thousand to fifty copies or less or to be undetectable. And I think what is important, even if I'm coming to you and I'm not an advocate, uh, as an advocate, I can advocate for myself and I can uh, tell you the plans that I have, uh, um, which include uh, what Fungai and Brittany have mentioned, peer support, taking my drugs on time, uh, probably dealing with mental issues or other issues that I may be having, even including lack of food that I cannot take my medication. Um, but if I was not an advocate, I would still want to go to a facility and feel that the doctor understands where I'm coming from and gives me the right and correct information to help me and assist me in getting from a thousand to to, to undetectable um, because it is possible uh, for everyone I want to believe. Um, but without the consistent and right information from people uh, that you look up to, that you trust uh, with your health, like the healthcare providers, then this um, the burden should not again be switched back uh, to the woman alone or to the girl alone. I believe it's sort of a shared burden with the one who has information and with the one who is coming to you to seek uh, information and treatment. So it's possible with our combined efforts. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Lucy. So, so what I'm hearing from everyone is beyond the science, which you need advocacy, we need trust, and we need the providers also to be up to date with what's happening and to be able to advocate for their own patients uh, um, while the patients are also advocating for themselves with their care providers and peer support being a mediator and really a catalyst in this whole process. So I will take a couple of uh, uh, questions from the audience. Um, so I'll read a question first and then we'll see who will be able to answer that. So there's a question from Libokano Segete who says, um, oh, it's moved. Is it rather advisable to show um, women living with HIV to opt for bottle or formula feeding than breastfeeding earlier on as so as to reduce chances of infection since it does come down to awareness that adherence could substantially um, um, be bad or adherence could wane or wax and wane with time. Okay, so um, how would you how would you look at that? I think Lynn, could you answer the part of that, and then I'll have one of our panelists, other panelists, also address that. Sure, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, so I think this is always a risk benefit balance here. So, if a woman has a very low viral load, if she's certainly if she's less than 50, the risk of transmission is extremely low. And um, you need to say, what are the benefits of breastfeeding and what's the downside of breastfeeding? And I do think that in the end, that ends up to be an individual woman's decision. If you're living in a low income country where the risk of infant mortality due to diarrhea and pneumonia, which can be reduced by breastfeeding is high, to me, the benefit clearly outweighs the risk. And in a higher income country, I think that's a more difficult question to answer, but the person to answer that should be the woman. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lynn. So Fungai, how would you answer this question? 
I think, as, as Lynn said, I mean, I, I live in the UK and uh, there is, we're, when presented with a choice uh, um, on having a baby as a woman with HIV, not only was I presented with the full support from the clinicians, from peer support, if I chose to go down the path of breastfeeding, I was also given the financial resources, um, i.e. the bottle, the formula and everything through a government grant, if I wanted to breastfeed. So it's a very difficult conversation to have and we cannot have it as a universal conversation because culturally, social, economically, we are on very different platforms. So it is a very difficult one. And I think we, we, we should not underestimate the power of choice. A mom that has been given the choice becomes more empowered to do the very best for their child and for their own health and for their own community around them like Brittany said, we do not. We will walk on ash, on 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 you know, on on coals of fire to protect our children. But we just need to be realistic of where we are in the world, our economic background, our cultural background, before we have this one fits all advice. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, Brittany, you had mentioned in your bio that at uh, the time that you discovered you were living with HIV you were pregnant and uh, you were asked not to breastfeed. How did you feel about that versus today having the possibility of breastfeeding with ART? Yeah, um, so my oldest is now 15. She'll be 15 here in a few months. Um, it's been a really long time. Uh, my diagnosis came you know, within two weeks of having the baby. And so um, I didn't really think much of it. I was scared to death. I didn't know much about HIV and I thought I was going to die. Um, I also uh, participated in local parenting programs and I wasn't able to breastfeed. And one of the things that I very quickly uh, started experiences with was shame and stigma about not being able to do what society says is best. Um, and even so- Even in Canada. Even in Canada, yeah. you know, and, and it's been a really interesting experience. So I, I was on a call a few weeks ago and I actually, you know, still kind of feel those impacts 15 years later of not being given all of the accurate information or not being given an appropriate choice. And for me, the worst part about it was, um, okay, so I was advised not to breastfeed, but there was nobody actually that identified that I needed support in that after the fact, because what society says is the best for my baby, I couldn't meet that, that, that standard ceiling or level. And so I actually could have used um, more peer, peer support or something like that. And so I think it's also important for us to, um, it, it, when we're giving people choices, also recognize the impacts of those potential choices or lack thereof. I noticed that a few times we've said, we've talked about, you know, income in different countries and access. In Canada, we have over 46 First Nations communities without access to clean drinking water. So, you know, for me, we actually need to back up for a minute and have more conversations around, as Fungai said, you know, economic stability, cultural location, context, all of those different things. Um, but most definitely, you know, 15 years later, there's still a lot of regret. Um, and to be frank and honest, a little bit of anger um, that more has not been done for women living with HIV in the past 15 years to um, help us understand our, our risk or lack thereof to our children. Thank you. Thank you for, for being quite frank about this. I appreciate it. So there is another question here um, from Natella Rachmanina. Um, thank you, Lynn. Can you comment, please? For sexual U equals U, we also use transmission risk per sexual act. Now, have we looked at transmission risk based on breastfeeding encounter or per breastfeeding session for maternal U equals U? So, Lynn, can you take this question, please? Yeah, yeah. So, um, this requires somebody who does modeling, and I'm not a modeler. I'm sure someone has potentially looked at it, but certainly you breastfeed. I don't know, I'm trying to remember with my daughter, you know, six to eight times a day. Um, so, uh, so Natalia, you'll need to do the math for me. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, Natella, you'll have to uh, sort this one out. Um, I'm not, I don't do modeling either. <laughs> so, um, but I think we should also mention that you know, there's a lot of information that we've received from our panelists with regard to thinking about the, 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 the women and mothers that we are giving advice to, we are giving treatment to, we are giving care to. They, they, to be able to give them the best of what is available 
that they can make choices from. And it's not a one size fits all. And I'm hearing a lot about choice and, and, and um, decision making. And to be honest, you find that when you give people choices and make them feel like they actually have some power in making decisions, I think you get better retention. There are studies that have shown that you get better compliance with the mutual plan. You get better sustainability of the plan. And then as science is evolving, you update the plan to make sure that they have the best of what is available. Um, so this is not a static plan at all. And, and you know, I think we continue to, as, as the same way as mothers and women living with HIV, continue to be looking up information. Uh, providers are also looking up information, making sure that, you know, did I miss something? Is there something coming out that I haven't made available to my clients? And what is available in my community or in my country versus other countries? Um, so what I'm going to do is, is have to, to wrap up now because we have to go to the next session. But I really, if we had more time, we'd really much more to learn uh, from our panelists as well. But I'd like to thank Lynn for her presentation. I mean, lots of data to, uh, to download in the brain and really to thank Brittany, Lucy and Fungai. I've really, really enjoyed this, this session and I really appreciate your time. I'm sure I'll be calling on you in future to give us more insights to keep us on our toes. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone. Thank you very, very much for your time. And I think we'll just sign off uh, now. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Lucy. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.